The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on January 23rd, 2022. 3.16 p.m. Tchaikovsky conducted with one hand under his chin, since he thought his head would fall off if he didn't support it. He may have been right. He may have been left. Well, he died of cholera, but not before overcoming the fear of his head falling off. Too bad he didn't have an anti-cholera plan. True. Charles VI of France suffered from glass delusion. He believed he was made of glass. Apparently, that was a fairly common phobia in that era. Well, I've seen how glass was made even a couple centuries later, and I think it's unlikely that he was correct. But I wasn't there, so... Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the brothers through yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about Tchaikovsky. Maybe we'll talk about heads falling off. Maybe we'll talk about cholera, glass delusion, or monarchs of the Middle Ages who are made of glass. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we tuck our mental illnesses away to examine the sort of mental illness which topples heads and turns royal backsides into glass, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quest for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus it's time for ablutions and edification. Well, Brother Brad, we're both going to contribute today, but let's start it off with your bit of edification. In episode 25, we talked about some heroic failures when we were walking through some famous exploration expeditions. Yeah. I ran across a lovely quote that reinforces the idea of heroic failures. I was reading about a gentleman who injured a bicep during an attempt to break the Guinness World Record for chin-ups. Oh, yeah, that happens. And then after he tore his bicep, uh, he quoted Bruce Lee and said, Don't fear failure. Not failure, but low aim is the crime. In great attempts, it is glorious even to fail. So I thought that was a nice sentiment and likely describes many of the famous explorers across time. They went for it. Sometimes they succeeded, sometimes they failed, but they weren't guilty of the crime of striving for mediocrity, which coincidentally is what I tell everyone is my motto, striving for mediocrity. Well, it seems like the only people who are really failing are the ants who haven't even given a shot to lifting the Empire State Building yet. Not even a shot. I do think Magnus Ver Magnusons would if we could find them all. How many Magnus Ver Magnusons was it? 800 some thousand? It was a lot. Yeah, we just need to find them. Well, that's a great bit of edification. I'm going to hit us up with a little bit of edification. Do you remember an episode called Holy Ghost Parties and Hands Across America? I do. It was a fine episode. Yeah, and it wasn't too long ago. In support of that episode, as I always do, I wanted to issue some episode art. I usually put it up on Instagram and some of the platforms like Spotify actually show that artwork. And I had an image of Dr. Pastor Enoch Ediboya himself that I wanted to use for that. I had taken that image as a screenshot from one of their YouTube videos. So I reached out to the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Nigeria to see if we were allowed to use that image. And I initially reached out to them back in May. In fact, it was May 23rd that I first contacted them. And I sent them an email saying, my brother and I host a small podcast here in the United States. The premise is that we talk about things we find interesting, yada, yada, yada. When one of us learned about the size of the RCCG, the Redeemed Christian Church of God, we were very much intrigued because it was totally different than anything we'd ever experienced. As such, we've recently recorded an episode and talked about some basic facts about the church and Pastor Adaboye and moved on to other discussion. For each episode, I create an image which some podcast services display. I put it on our Instagram account at Things I Text My Brother Podcast, and I try to use images which are in the public domain, but I would really like to use an image that I created by taking a screen grab of one Daddy Geo, Daddy General Overseer, delivering a sermon as posted on YouTube by your church. However, I don't want to do so without permission. This is all absolutely true, Brad. I reached out to the church in Nigeria, and I said, I want to use the image. 
I sent a copy of the image. I told them our audience is small at present, which is perhaps me just being a little modest. I know our audience is very large. (laughs) But I said that mostly we talk about the scale of the church. And if anything, I would expect that listeners who are not familiar with the RCCG will come away intrigued. And a few of them might look for more information. Thank you for taking time to read my inquiry. We look forward to your reply. So yeah, that was on May 24th. I sent it again on May 30th. And guess what happened on June 23rd? They said no. They said no. Pastor Ni Adebanyo, who is the secretary to the general overseer, so Daddy Geo secretary, he reached out a very cordial email saying, Calvary greetings in Jesus' name. Thank you for your email. Kindly note that the general overseer of the redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor E.A. Adeboye, has, in capital letters, not approved your report. Thank you. Pastor Ni Adebanyo, Secretary to the General Overseer, Lagos, Nigeria. They turned us down, Brad. Uh, I don't know. I thought no publicity was bad publicity, but uh, I guess it is. I guess they're worried about people finding out about the prosperity doctrine of Nigerian Pentecostalism. But I did send them a cordial email reply, which I don't think you've seen or heard. On Monday the 27th, I reached back out to Daddy Geo's office, and I presumed to Ni, who had written me, Thank you for your consideration. While we have already published the episode, we had not received approval, so we did not use the image. That's true. I played it safe. We use stock imagery instead. We will be sure to let our listeners know that we were denied this basic request. But feel free to listen to our episode with our compliments. And then I pasted the Spotify link. No word yet as to whether Pastor Ni or Pastor Enoch Adeboye have listened to our episode, but listeners just want you to know that the Redeemed Christian Church of God in Nigeria totally shot us down for reasons that I can't quite sort out when we wanted to give them free publicity in over 35 countries across the globe. Well, it seems to be their loss. I'm fine with it either way because you found some lovely art to use anyhow. Yeah. And uh, for all of our listeners out there that are looking for a church that can seat 3 million people, I'd say look elsewhere. (laughs) (laughs) Well, with our edification and edification out of the way, now we have to jump back into that text message from January 23rd where you talked about heads falling off and people thinking they were made of glass. But what are we going to talk about today? I want to start with a paraphrasing or even possibly a quote here uh, from an article by Hadley Mears on history.com. This is what started it all off for me. Princess Alexandra Amalie of Bavaria in the late 1840s as a 23 year old woman informed those around her that she had swallowed a glass grand piano in its entirety. She did what? She swallowed a glass grand piano in its entirety in one piece. How big was this girl? Uh, Not big enough to have swallowed an entire glass grand piano, but there you have it. And it was at risk of shattering in her stomach and killing her. Well, that sounds insane, and it appears that young (laughs) Alexandra had some other issues. It apparently wasn't all that unusual. So this is from History.com. The princess was, in fact, following in a long tradition of royals, nobles, and scholars who believed that all or certain parts of their bodies were made of clear, fragile glass, known as the glass delusion, This psychological malady, first recorded in the Middle Ages, would become quite common before virtually dying out in the late 19th century. So people aren't still having glass delusions? Uh, They may be. Uh, There is a gentleman in the city of Leiden that was a documented case of glass delusion. Mm. And uh, the response from his doctors sort of reinforces the whole idea that maybe glass delusion was based on people feeling melancholy or depression or loneliness, as we might call it today. Melancholy and the infinite sadness? Apparently. The the patient asked the doctor to look through a window and tell him what the doctor could see. The doctor mentioned the scene outside, traffic and a park and some benches and some birds and some trees, so on and so forth. And the patient said, ah, you have missed the glass in the window. You didn't see it there, but it is there. That's me. I'm there and I'm not there. Like the glass in the window. That makes me sad. So in modern times, it seems like the glass delusion is more about being seen or unseen rather than this patient in Leiden, which I believe Leiden's where the pilgrims went before they came to the United States, by the way. But this patient in Leiden is not so much concerned 
like Charles the the sixth of France that his specifically Charles the sixth was worried about his buttocks being made of glass. Yes. And this person in Leiden doesn't appear to be concerned about that. He appears to be concerned about being seen. Yeah, that was kind of sad. But like you said, Charles the sixth of France was one of the better known sufferers of the glass delusion. Uh, he was once known as Charles the Beloved early in his reign, but he slowly became known as Charles the Mad. And we talked about all kinds of unfortunate nicknames back in episode seven, so I won't dive into that again. <laughs> but real quickly, unlucky for Charles the Mad to be known as Charles the Mad because his predecessors were known as the wise, the good, the fortunate, the bold, the fair, or the beautiful, if you will. You see what I did there? Mm -hmm. But yeah, the Mad indeed was unfortunate. And he even started out as the beloved, so he right. was starting on the right track. Right, he was. And then yeah. he has, what, a, a schizophrenic bout, and he ends up with this glass delusion. And specifically, I read about him, what I thought was interesting is that glass delusion impacted people. Some people thought their whole body was made of glass or just their body parts. In modern times, it seems to be more about anxiety and the space people are existing in. Right. With Charles the Sixth, I thought it was interesting that he thought specifically it was his booty that was in trouble. So he would stay motionless for hours, wrapped in his blankets, and he would wear a special garment when he did have to move around so that he had these, um, I guess they, they call them ribs of iron that were wrapped around to protect his glass organs. Did he have, I wonder if he had iron ribs protecting his glass ass, though. <laughs> I don't know, but muchas glassy ass, I guess. I was interested in the fact that there were apparently a number of contemporaries who were suffering from glass delusion. And I was reading a little bit about other famous people of the era Ooh. in that range of Middle Ages to the 19th century. That's a large range. Yeah, I'd, I'd seen something saying like 1500s through like the 1830s or 1840s. So a good amount of time. But there were some famous people who were philosophers or writers or authors who, who did mention it. So René Descartes, of course, being oh. a famous philosopher. Sure. He included a thing about glass delusion to demonstrate how insane people do not necessarily see the world as it is, because the idea that you might be made out of glass seemed pretty wild. Even Cervantes had a character known as El Licenciado Vidriera, or the lawyer of glass, who suffered from a version of glass delusion. Hmm. It was well known enough among you know writers and philosophers of the time. And I saw articles suggesting that it was people who were of the upper classes, people who would have been in the public eye and unable to escape them. And all that makes sense. Speaking of which, though, Princess Alexandra Amelie. Yes. It seems she was the daughter of the recently abdicated King Ludwig I of Bavaria. He said that she swallowed a grand piano and she was worried that her body would shatter because the piano was inside of her. Uh, was she at all concerned with the digestion, with passing the piano? Did she eventually go to the bathroom and eliminate the problem? I never saw anything saying whether she got over it. She was worried that it was going to shatter inside her and cause her damage on the inside. Mm. She was fine with it in its entirety. Being one big whole giant piano wasn't really causing her any issues. It was the idea that it might shatter inside her and cause her bodily harm. But she had some other issues, apparently, may have been a bit crazy yeah. at the time. I was interested in seeing the people who had it in the past. It's one thing. They're figuring out what glasses and as other new types of technologies happen, people are scared of them, whether it's concrete back then. And it still continues to this day with technology and all that. 5G network. Yeah, 5G networks and all that. All right, yeah. But I was interested in, all right, like what's going on in the head for this woman who swallowed the piano for Charles VI and for the person in Leiden in modern times or presumably like what's going on right now. And I did see a quote from psychoanalyst Adam Phillips saying that the glass delusion has powerful contemporary resonance in a society which anxieties about fragility, transparency, and personal space are pertinent to many people's experience of and anxieties about living in the modern world which that yeah. makes a lot of sense to me. And it would be very easy to see how the wealthy people in society would feel some of those pressures of court being around them, of all these big decisions that maybe the average person didn't have, yeah. which I suppose is why the people who are out there in the mud commune that they address in uh, Monty Python, <laughs> why they weren't having glass delusion. Although nothing seems more Monty Python, not that I think of it, than glass delusion. And it, it feels like it, they missed an opportunity there, but maybe the research wasn't there yet. I was reading, there was a, a doctoral student, Elena Fabietti, 
her whole research for her doctorate and postgraduate study has been around transparent humans and how they're represented through European cultural history. It's called Bodies of Glass, a cultural history of transparent humans, in which she's turning it into a study of the representation of the body and notions of humanity. So I think she took it a little bit beyond the Charles VI and closer to the patient mm -hmm. from Leiden in terms of what did it mean to be kind of a transparent human and are you invisible? Do some of us feel that way? And I think that's an interesting shift in it from being a building material. When it all started, like you said, it was new building materials. Transparent glass was kind of new. Only the rich would have access to this transparent glass. So the other people either didn't have glass at all in their houses, most likely, hadn't really seen it other than maybe in a church. So this mm -hmm. idea of transparent glass it just made people think, well, maybe maybe I'm glass because you can see through the glass into my body. I don't know. It's, it seems like an odd leap to me. Mm. But then again, hopefully I'm not crazy. Well, if you could see through a person's body, would it just be the skin or would it be the body itself? Because if you're only looking through the skin, do you know who you'd have then? Slim good body! You'd have Slim good body! The whole world full of Slim good bodies would be creepy. Yeah. Well, we certainly spent a great deal of time talking about mass hysterias in episode 29, including consumptive vampires in New England and choreomania oh, around yeah. the world. I don't really think glass delusion falls into mass hysteria. Doesn't seem like it when, yeah. especially these days, it's only happened a handful of times in yeah. recent centuries. But even at its most expansive, it seemed to be happening to a handful of royals and scholars across Europe. Yeah, that's kind of my thought. I didn't bring it up in that episode one because I thought it was a cool topic on its own for a future conversation. You know, and also Tchaikovsky's weak neck syndrome didn't seem to add up to a mass hysteria. What with Tch Tchaikovsky's weak neck syndrome? Yeah, speaking of Tchaikovsky, I suppose a lot of people probably knew of his issues, but that was the first I had heard about it. On the negative side, he seemed to have several issues on top of his stage fright that was embodied by his head and neck issues where he couldn't direct. He directed a couple times throughout his early career. He couldn't conduct, Brad. He couldn't conduct. What did I say? Direct. Is it the same thing? No, you're right. Tchaikovsky wasn't making Russian movies in the 1890s. Well, maybe not. Uh, he was dying of cholera. But uh, he, he had <laughs> head and neck issues. But it seemed to only really be when he was conducting. Yeah. It was a manifestation or an embodiment of his stage fright, it looked like. Because it was yeah. only two or three times in his early career that he was able to get up there and conduct. And he would have to hold his head still with one hand and conduct with the other because he thought his head was going to fall off. And it just became so overwhelming. He just didn't do it. He seemed to have gotten over it, though, in his later career, even opening Carnegie Hall in 1891. Where does he think his head's going to go? Like, all right. I think it was more his neck. They said his head falling off in the article I read. But I think they were really talking about like it was just his neck was just going to flop and his head was just going to dangle <laughs> down off the side of his body. and his neck. So was he just was going to turn into one of those blow up uh, parking lot guys whose arms and, and <laughs> yeah. head and everything just yeah, wave yeah. around. Only each movement he had would send an orchestra in an entirely different direction and Swan Lake would become some kind of parking lot theater. Well, if he would have spent less time worrying about his neck and head falling off and more time reading articles written by Jon Snow from England, who really kind of discovered that this huge cholera outbreak in the 1840s in London was concentrated around one water pump that people oh. in, in this poor neighborhood were drinking from. If anybody had listened to him, a lot fewer people would have died of cholera, maybe even Tchaikovsky, if they would have taken it seriously, that it wasn't airborne and it was through spoiled water, basically. That person's name was Jon Snow? Yes, and he did know something. You know nothing, Jon Snow. He did Snow. know something. That's why they didn't listen to him, is because the wildlings say that Jon Snow knows nothing. C.S. Lewis and I were just discussing. You and Jon Snow both know nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I was in an epic rap battle between J.R.R. Tolkien and George R.R. R. Martin. Yeah, well, that explains why he's not finishing these Ice and Fire series. Oh, yeah, he had, he had a lot going on, having epic rap battles with, with Tolkien. I was learning a lot about Tchaikovsky, and you were mentioning he had all these problems. One article I saw, which was actually posted on a website for the California Symphony, was saying that he was prone to immense angst self-doubt, bouts of depression. He was a closeted gay man in 19th century imperial Russia, so he was experiencing extreme self-loathing and constant fear of being outed. He got married to a woman, one of his students, and stayed married to her for 10 weeks. 10 weeks! He drank, he smoked, he gambled, and for whatever reason, he was easily reduced to tears. He suffered his debilitating stage fright. He was worried about his head falling off. This is a guy that had a lot of issues. 
I'm pretty impressed that he managed to do anything during his time, let alone come up with the Nutcracker and the 1812 Overture and all Which the- he thought was just really loud and not good, the 1812 Overture. I don't know whether to trust his judgment after all the other things I've heard about. He said it clearly lacked passion, mm. but he wrote it himself. I was looking into some things in addition to Tchaikovsky. I was like, all right, so he's got some stuff going on. What about the rest of people? A lot of what I found out was not all that exciting. I found this bizarre composer facts list from Classic FM who said, listen to this, Brad. It said that Vivaldi had acute bronchial asthma. Isn't that crazy? I mean, I I don't think so. No. Schubert was called Little Mushroom by his friends because he was short. Isn't that crazy? No. Oh my gosh. A heap of composers seem to be self-medicating procrastinators. There was this guy named Thomas Wilkes. Was that uh, John Wilkes Booth's relative? No, it's it's spelled totally differently. Oh, okay. Thomas Wilkes is W-E-E-L-K-E-S, and I'd never heard of him, but he was eventually kicked out of the Chichester Cathedral for being a character that would curse too much and drink too much. Hmm. They managed to fire him, though, well after he had already urinated on the dean of the cathedral. It seems like that would have been the moment to fire him. In the cathedral? Don't know, but either way, I don't think you want to be urinating on the dean. Hey, dean! Hey, (laughs) dean! Yeah. One of the composer facts that I came across here is one that I then explored a lot more. So on this Classic FM site, the fact was listed as the following. Bach and Handel were both blinded by the same ocular surgeon named John Taylor. Oh, his name wasn't Dr. Light? blinded by the light. But you know what they were blinded by, Brad? He blinded them with science. Oh, or not. Or lack thereof. Or a lack thereof. So let's talk about this because this ends up being a great story that there are many sources on. I ended up referring to this article that was issued by the medical school at the University of Wisconsin. The article was called Handel, Bach were blinded by 18th century quackery. Uh, Let me just start out by giving you some of the basic facts. As presented by this article, a University of Wisconsin-Madison ophthalmologist says both Handel and Bach underwent eye surgery at the hands of an oculist called the Chevalier John Taylor. Taylor was the poster child for 18th century quackery, says Daniel Albert, MD, MS, the author of Men of Vision, A History of Ophthalmology. Have you read Men of Vision, A History of Ophthalmology? I have made it a life goal to never read about ophthalmology. (laughs) All right. Well, you wouldn't know any of this then. I don't. This is all news to me. I'm ready. Handel died more than 250 years ago, and he lived with declining vision for the last decade of his life following a failed cataract surgery by Taylor. Bach died a few months after his surgery for what was described as a painful eye condition, which Albert believes may have been cataracts and a detached retina. A post-operative infection likely killed Bach. So not only does this gentleman, John Taylor, blind both Handel and Bach, infections related to the surgery essentially kill Bach shortly after. So he's got quite the track record going on here. Yeah. Before we get too crazy about this, it's worth pointing out that physicians at the time had little concept of bacteria. They had no anesthesia. So the idea was to operate as quickly as possible. And if you had a good result in a third of surgeries, according to Albert, that was pretty good. Didn't Sir Isaac Newton, like, poke needles in his own eye as a research study? I believe I read that once. This is something I don't know anything about. Yeah, I think he was bored during college or was kicked out from college, something like that. And he just spent some time poking himself in the eye with things. Well, that seems like a bad idea because, as Albert says of these 18th century techniques, people didn't expect a good outcome. They knew if they put themselves in the hands of an eye surgeon, they were taking a big chance. But he then goes on to point some other stuff. The risk may have been greater with a charlatan like Taylor. Albert describes him as the most infamous of all ophthalmic quacks. His arrival into town would be heralded by placards and handbills, and his coach was decorated with paintings of eyeballs and the Latin motto, which translates to, he who gives sight gives life. So this guy had kind of a, a big head about him. Yeah. And I'll go on to quote, he practiced in the most flamboyant way, drawing crowds to watch his procedures in the town square and then getting out of town before patients took their bandages off. In Bach's case, not only did a surgery and a second one fail, but he developed painful post-operative infection, was treated with laxatives, and the favorite cure of the day, bleeding. He was blind when he dictated his final work, and he died a few months later. Basically, this guy Taylor, I saw another PDF medical history by David M. Jackson. 
he said Taylor's career was destructive. His general approach included bloodletting, laxatives, eye drops of blood from slaughtered pigeons, pulverized sugar, or baked salt. I don't even understand how some of that stuff factors into this equation. But this guy admitted to blinding hundreds of people. He skipped town as soon as his procedures were over after coming into town with a decorated wagon and basically announcing to town how great he was and how great this is all going to go. So yeah, this gentleman, John Taylor, seems like kind of a real slime ball, or as one person I saw describing him, total garbage. He does seem like total garbage, and frankly, I'm scarred by this. Not as scarred as the <laughs> composers, obviously. No, but at least in Bach's case, he wasn't scarred for very long. Another totally different rabbit hole that I ended up going down with this is I don't actually pretend to know much about classical music, but I do like a couple of French composers, and Eric Satie is definitely one of my favorites. But I didn't realize what a weirdo Eric Satie is. Do you know anything about this man, Brad? I know nothing about composers or ophthalmologists. So Satie was a French composer. He's best known for his piano suite, the three gymnopedies, which basically this gymnopedie thing is weird in itself. It's basically this tradition of dancing nude that goes way back to the Greeks. And Sati oh. brought this back and people didn't even know what it was. I thought it was Jim doesn't pedal a bike. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. Jim no pedal. Jim no, oh, Jim no pedal. Great, Brad. You're doing great. I'm doing great today. But this Satya guy, different accounts said that he owned 12 identical suits, velvet suits, and he wore one repeatedly until they wore out and died with six. Saw another one just saying he wore a different one every day of the week. But he did wear his velvet suits. He detested the sun. He carried a hammer in his pocket for self-defense. And he established his own church, which was called the Metropolitan Church of Art of Jesus the Conductor. How many members do you think this church went on record as having? Three. One. Ah! You overdid it. They don't need to build the giant building that the redeemed Christian Church of God in Nigeria has yet, especially because the only living member is not living. He's quite dead, Eric Sati. But Sati died in 1925 of cirrhosis of the liver, not before publishing a single page of music called Vexations, which was 28 hours long if performed correctly. So let me ask you, Brother Brad, how do you have a single page of music that turns into a 28-hour composition? I don't. If you're Eric Sati, it's because you give specific instructions for vexations to be played 840 times straight, and then it is a 28-hour piece of music. I don't even understand what a vexation is. <laughs> other than, I thought a vexation was when you vexed someone and made them annoyed, which, frankly, maybe that's what's happening right now. <laughs> it seems like he would have. <laughs> He was also obsessed with numbers, so in addition to playing vexations 840 times, the 8 and the 4 repeat themselves because when he died, he was found not just with 100 umbrellas, but 84 handkerchiefs and numerous letters, most of which were written by himself. And I now want to actually read you a little bit that was taken from one of his writings, Memoirs of an Amnesiac, written in 1912 in which he describes his diet. Aren't you excited to hear what this composer you've never heard of ate? Was it only coconuts? Because I've read about Cocovarian before. My only nourishment consists of food that is white. Oh. Eggs, sugar, shredded bones. So he could eat coconuts. Coconuts would work. Yeah. The fat of dead animals, veal, salt, coconuts, ah. chicken cooked in white water, moldy fruit, rice, turnip, sausages, and something I can't pronounce. Pastry, cheese, but only the white varieties. Cotton salad, never heard of it. And certain kinds of fish without their skin. I have a good appetite, but I never talk when I'm eating for fear of strangling myself. I don't think he should worry about strangling himself. I think other people would have taken care of that for him if he left his apartment for the last 20-something years of his life. What do you think even a cotton salad was? Like, you couldn't just eat cotton, right? I mean, you can do anything you want if you're a weirdo. <laughs> at, least, at least once, I guess, yeah. One more bit of just craziness since this all got started talking about composers that do bizarre things or Tchaikovsky with his head falling off. Sati, whose head never did fall off, he also wrote basically his daily schedule. And his daily schedule was, as this article that I found it in said, unusual. I rise at 718. Am inspired from 1023 to 1147. Ooh. Brad, what would you do if you were inspired from 1023 to 1147 each morning? Each morning? Yep. 
I would be amazed at myself. Think of how much more successful I would be in life if I actually ever felt inspired. What's he doing between 718 and the inspiration that begins at 1023, though? Morning constitutional. Is that going to the bathroom? No, I think it's a walk. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's a euphemism, I suppose, but yeah. I lunch at 1211 and leave the table at 1214. So not a math wizard here, but to me, that's a three minute lunch, which seems like he would have more time for that. But maybe if you're eating cotton salad, you don't want more time for that. A healthy ride on horseback around my domain follows from 119 to 253 p.m. Another bout of inspiration from 312 to 407. From 427 to 647 p.m., various occupations, including fencing, reflection, immobility, visits, contemplation, dexterity, natation, etc. Dinner is served at 716, finished at 720. From 809 to 959, symphonic readings out loud. I go to bed regularly at 1037. Once a week, I wake up at 319, Tuesdays. 319 in the morning? 319 in the morning. I breathe with care, a little at a time. I rarely dance. When walking, I clasp my sides and look steadily behind me. My expression is very serious. When I laugh, it's unintentional. And I always apologize most affably. Do you think he smokes, Brad? I would say yes. He absolutely smokes. My doctor has always told me to smoke. Part of his advice runs, smoke away, dear chap. If you don't, someone else will. The end. <laughs> someone else will. Did he say he walks looking behind him the entire time? Uh, I breathe with care. I very rarely dance when walking. I clasp my sides and look steadily behind me. Yeah. He doesn't watch where he's going while smoking. It just seems like a danger. He appears to be a, a genuine weirdo, but I'm in favor of him. He does feel like he's a bit weird, yeah. Yeah, and I really want to get a hold of his writings, which seem to be part autobiography and part gibberish. Mostly gibberish. Well, I'm fairly certain anything I wrote would be totally gibberish, so I can't judge on that front. Hmm. Well, Brother Brad, there's one man whom we haven't heard from yet about any of these subjects. He's not a quack, but he's definitely an eccentric. He's our Father Art, and we're going to ask him some questions. In hindsight, Tchaikovsky died of cholera, and not from his head falling off. Do you believe there's a direct correlation between his efforts to hold his head in place and the fact that it never fell off? Yes, it certainly makes sense to me. Should he have spent more time attempting to protect himself from cholera? Well, in, in hindsight, yes, but, but who knows about that sort of thing until it's too late. Who is your favorite classical composer, and did he or she retain their heads? Uh, Bach. Bach. Just because I like to say the name. Some folks during the late Middle Ages experienced a disorder called glass delusion, in which they feared they were made of glass and in danger of breaking. Given the state of the world at that time, do you think that this was probably the most practical thing for them to worry about? Well, maybe not, but, uh, you know, you, you have to respond to, to what you're thinking at the time, and that probably uh, was what they were worried about at the time. One individual famously swallowed a small glass animal figurine, and decided she was made of glass because she had swallowed this figurine. If you had swallowed an item and had decided you were made of it, what would that have been? Probably a Christmas tree ornament. <laughs> Why were you eating Christmas tree ornaments? Because they looked tasty. They were in the shape of food. Didn't you electrocute yourself with a Christmas tree once? I tried to, but I was only four or five, so that hardly counts. I think you have some weird obsession with dying from Christmas trees. I, I do. Yeah. You were born and raised on the streets of the Glass City. Did any of your friends or family exhibit signs of experiencing a glass delusion during your time there? No, but uh, I did know people who worked at the glass factory or whose parents worked at the glass factory. And they did not believe they were made of glass after working there? No. That's but, good. But they were kind of shiny. <laughs> Folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say about cotton salad, transparent humans, gymnopodies, Charles the Beloved, Charles the Mad, the Metropolitan Church of Art of Jesus the Conductor, and the most infamous of all the ophthalmic quacks. 
But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there will be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked, what you didn't like, or to tell us about something we got totally wrong. You might even have enough time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of Driards will be forever grateful. And if you manage to go to our merch store, well, we'll come over and give you a high five in person. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. In the year 2000. Yeah. In the year 2000. Do you remember that? We are robots. Well, I haven't checked our blood drive team lately, but I'm going tomorrow to give more blood and add to the numbers and to get some fruit snacks. Mom says that she's making Joe and Carolyn join our blood donation team.